Welcome to the Climate Report. This is Hart Hagen, and I'm here with Nick Alden. How are you doing today, Nick? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. Great. So we're going to talk about uh, good ideas and bad ideas in the climate movement and, uh, and go from there. Nick and I are both big picture people, uh, and we're going to try to tie some things together. So Nick, what's on your mind today? We, we were talking before the recording about like uh, impact and like human flourishing and trophic levels. So what's on your mind? I was thinking about how last time I still hadn't, I do so much intuitively that I hadn't really thought about what was it that makes me see catastrophe in some places and exaggeration in others. And I realized in chatting with you that it's all about impact. And I noticed that most people, they're either all impact or no impact. And I'm a sometimes impact person, right? And not just a sometimes. So when we look at environments, we have to assess the impact that we're having or going to have on it. And that if we look at it as we're either having an impact or we're not, we're gonna make dumb decisions. It seems to me that whenever you see an exaggeration of uh, something in the environment, it's always coming from people who are trying to have no impact and they're having an impact anyway. Right. So let me uh, repeat some of that back to you and see if I'm getting it right. So, you know, human beings, if we're going to, we live on the only planet we know of that's habitable, certainly the only planet we know of that's habitable to us. And we have to maintain a livable planet at the very least. And uh, so we want to have a positive impact in, in, mo in many ways, I would say in almost every way, hum you know, humans have had an overwhelmingly negative impact on the biosphere, on the world in which we live, not least of all in the area of farming and agriculture. I mean, I'm anti-war and, uh, you know, war is very extremely destructive, but I would argue that agriculture is even more destructive. And somebody said, I forget who it was, I might think of it in a minute, but uh, maybe it was Wes Jackson who said the plowshare has been more destructive than the sword. So we're doing a lot of negative things uh, to our biosphere. And some of the negative things we do are in the attempt to, to make food. So, so tell me more about this idea of some people have, some people have this vision that we're supposed to have no impact and how that's unrealistic, and we need to see ourselves as capable of having positive impact and go there. Well, I was thinking back to what Alston Chase said about his book. He said, I, there were lots of people who liked my book, but they liked it for the wrong reasons. He thought that they, they thought that he was justifying their exploitative ways and saying everything they wanted for the environment was good. Mm -hmm. So I see I broadly see, and it's not, it's more complex than this, but I broadly see you got people who want to have a negative impact on the environment. They want to exploit the environment and don't care about how it impacts. And then the other end, you have people who see impacts everywhere where they don't exist, right? And this all comes down to when you've decided you don't want to have an impact or a footprint, you're going to find things that you will justify as not having an impact. We need to stop talking about renewables as though they don't have an impact on the environment. Whether or not they're good is a separate issue, but they have an impact, right? So we have to discuss how do we have an impact and what kind of impact we have. Um, and it seems to me that some of Savory's detractors are upset with him because he's saying we need to have a bigger impact. Indeed, I'd go as far as to say, when people ask you, do you believe in climate change? They are asking, do you believe we have an impact on the environment? Well, let me Which bounce off of that. Let me bounce off of that. So in the environmental movement, uh, what I call the mainstream environmental movement, your typical person who fits that description is somebody who is for solar panels and against cows. And I think what they don't realize is that solar panels have a, have a decidedly negative impact. I think they have a place, but there, we, we, ha we have this slick PR, this slick marketing that tells us that here's something that has no impact. 
when if you look at how the sausage is made, solar panels and solar energy and all the infrastructure that's needed for that does have a negative impact. You know, lithium mining in Bolivia, the mining of cobalt in Congo, lots of negative impacts, innumerable negative impacts. Uh, but and so the average, you know, environmentalist would be pro solar and against beef. But we know because we've studied Alan Savory and we've participated in soil for climate, that beef can not only can have a, not only can be benign, not only can have a positive impact, but some of us, including myself, are saying we need cows to restore our grasslands and it has to be done strategically. It has to be done intelligently. What we wanna do is biomimicry we want to mimic what nature used to do before we killed off all the megafauna, you know, so we can have a positive. So we need, we need that positive impact. Right. I think it comes down to the idea that if you're separate from nature, you don't have it, you have an impact on it, but nature has a huge impact on itself. We need to save all of the uh, large megafauna that still exist in Africa and Asia. Because when you remove large numbers of animals, all the poop and urine they make goes away. Yeah. And so, so. how to do that is, is another thing. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm the type of person, you know, my strategy in this whole thing is to spread ideas, baby, because there's plenty of good ideas. There's plenty of people that care and the people that care uh, don't know enough of the good ideas that they would embrace if they knew about them. So, you know, we need lo lots of acreage where cattle are restoring the grasslands. And then hopefully with that will come a consciousness of how nature works and, and think uh, how nature works, how we fit into nature, how we can have a positive impact on nature and work cooperatively with nature as opposed to, you know, or to think of your average farmer, your average farmer that participates in what we would call degenerative agriculture, you know, genetically modified corn as far as, far as the eye can see, lots of glyphosate, lots of Roundup. Well, that's somebody who unwittingly is participating in the destruction of his acreage, participating in the destruction of the, of, of the surrounding ecology. Well, that farmer and his or her community could, if they switch to regenerative, then they will become much, much, much more aware of how nature works and how, and they will see firsthand a cooperative model where humans cooperate with the natural world. Well, you know, and also it's kinder to the animals to have them out in the land. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how um, we in North America consume something like 50 million tons of meat or something like that. And was 19, we consumed 19 million tons of meat in the 1960s. Now we consume 50 million tons. And so I'm thinking to myself, we eat an awful lot of meat. Is it, and I don't doubt that with enough pressure, people would go to a plant-based diet, but even if the plant-based diet didn't have all these problems that, for the soil and for chemicals and whatnot, it's good, we, te we should probably get a raise animals while we're still eating them ethically. We should right. have them out on the rangelands. Right, absolutely. I mean, where vegans and um, the Alan Savory crowd ought to agree is that we need to get rid of these concentrated animal feeding operations. They're, they're hopelessly cruel. Uh, they're, they're really, really hard on the environment. So we ought to be able to agree on that. But so let's, we're talking about impact and one of the, so we're saying that a plant-based diet, it's hard to imagine a plant-based diet that, that, that does not have a lot of negative impact. I mean, insofar as the, as the plant-based diet is based on corn and soy, and these are annual crops and lots of tillage, and even if it's done organically, tillage is so destructive. So to me, plant-based diet, negative impact, unless you just bend over backwards to do it some way that I don't really know how to do, because I don't know how you do, I don't know how you grow plant-based food 
in the absence of animals. But yeah, and I think there, if you work backwards from here's something that's an impact, let's get rid of it, then you, you're going to not ask other questions. Like there's huge parts of the world that cannot feed people any other way than animals. Because what people miss, think about trophic levels, right? They say, okay, you got plants, the photosynthesize, and then you've got animals that eat the plants, the, you know, the primary consumers, and then you've got the uh, predators that eat them. And people in ecology seem to think, if we focus on lowering how far down the trophic level we eat, we're doing good for the environment, but they're not taking into account is the animals make food that we can't eat available to us. They make energy that is not available to us for us. And so I'm always astonished at how much gets left out of that picture. Well, when it, you know, the, the idea of trophic levels, it seems to me is um, the concept of efficiency is floating around there. And it's like, I think efficiency is the last refuge of the scoundrel. You know, they talk about efficiency and it's like the old saying, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel, Samuel Johnson. But efficiency, when somebody's talking about efficiency, I say, oh, stop. What are we being efficient at doing? What is supposedly efficient? What is supposedly inefficient? Because you can talk about efficiency without any concept of what we're trying to achieve. So. Uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Number two, begin with the end in mind. What is the goal? What is the vision? What are we trying to get to? And um, so when somebody says that uh, these tropic levels lose their efficiency, it's like, what is so darn inefficient about an animal? The well, animal the is, is contributing to its ecosystem and the animal eventually gets, uh, you know, gets to become food you know i think that again i'm trying to steel man this argument the idea is that when the plants lose like 90 percent of their energy in the process of making food nine then 90 percent of that energy is lost going to animals again what's missing is not well, just lost how, to what much... lost to what nature is doing something with that lost energy you know well yeah and that's because the urine and the dung go into the soil and fertilize it but uh, I'm just trying to steel man that argument because sure. I'm trying to understand yeah. the logic. Mm -hmm. Right. And as far as it goes, if you're stuck in academia, maybe it makes more sense. Maybe if you've never been on a farm, because one of the things that bothers me is that we're getting ignorant because we have not been, we're not exposed to nature anymore. We don't actually see animals. Mm -hmm. And I'm guilty of this too. When I went to Yellowstone National Park at 15 years old, I had never seen a bison. And I went up to the bison. <laughs> I had gone into the park saying, well, you know, you would be stupid to go up to animals and pet them. But remember, don't do that because they can kill you. They're dangerous. And here I am in the park. Practically, I would have put corn in my hand. You know, so it's like you can have all the egghead stuff in the world, but if you don't interact with nature, how on mm -hmm. earth do you understand it? Right. Uh, there was uh, Nicole Han Neiman, who wrote Defending Beef, has a chapter that, uh, you know, uh, explains the virtues of having people who grow up on farms. And it's not for everybody, but there's a tremendous advantages of growing up on farms, including a work ethic. There are CEOs and military leaders that much prefer to work with uh, people who grew up on a farm. And uh, one aspect of that, or, and there's also this knowledge of nature. If you grow up, I'm not talking about a, a big farm where you have a combine that's, you know, the, the uh, you have this big equipment and you're really removed from nature a lot of our farms the way they're done when you have a monocrop you're removed from nature but if you have a it doesn't even have to be a small farm but a biologically diverse farm like gabe brown like joel salatin like will harris these people have biologically diverse farms and they grow multiple kinds of animals they see the animals interact with their environment and you you start to understand you know how life works and that's a societal asset you know that's something that as a society we need to nurture and cultivate instead of ignoring or discouraging well it's funny because i thought the whole point was to get back to nature and to reintegrate us with it what i've learned from reading apocalypse never is that when we rely on nature we over exploit it and the key is to get um what do you call it? Synthetic substitutes. 
we want to not be getting any of our resources from natural ecosystems. We want to replace it with farming. And we wanna do that on as little space as possible, right? We wanna replace wild fish with aquaculture. We wanna replace, um, I think we wanna replace uh, factory farming and the hunting of bush meat with regenerative ranching. We wanna replace getting, you know, uh, wild harvesting wild plants with growing them on crops. And once you think in that framework, it becomes much more straightforward to find solutions. Because, you know, in many parts of the world, animals are being hunted indiscriminately for their bush meat. Yeah. And when, and when they're so, not, the, the snares that they put up catch animals that were unintended to be caught. Yeah. Um, and in the oceans, it's even worse because lots of animals, or bycatch is a huge problem out there. So. so, you know, one question is, how did we get to this situation where we are not where, where we are having a, such a negative impact. And I think you can't, um, you, you can't, I, I choose to see uh, like the, what, what is the role of capital in that? And capital is just, um, you know, a, a, a tool for control. You know, the, the people who have the most money ha are able to like, you know, people who have the money can enact NAFTA. And NAFTA had the effect of uh, driving a lot of Mexican and American farmers. Uh, you know, it, it messed with the economics of the small farm so that your small farmers, they have to take off farm jobs or they just they have to abandon their land altogether uh, for hundreds of years, if not longer. There's been a, a movement to drive common people off of the land and into the cities, and then the people with money can exploit the land, and then in the cities they provide cheap labor. That is a world that is made by and for the, a tiny fraction of people that have the most money. So, uh, and, and naturally, as a result of that, I choose to, the, what from where I sit, the result of all that is exploitation of nature, destruction of nature. Yeah, and so when I took my environmental ethics class, I was astonished how obsessed they were with CEOs making money. And yet it seems to me from our talk, I'm back here talking about CEOs making money in all sorts of ways that go under the radar, right? Um, because their thought is we got to reduce the amount we consume. This is what a lot of ecologists are thinking. Reduce the amount you consume, and then we don't have as big an impact on the environment. We can save it. And I don't think that's the final step for them. I think that, you know, the final step is, of course, to rebuild and rewild. But that first step of we got to degrowth, it has all sorts of problems. And the thinking it seems to go back to I don't like what CEOs are doing. I don't like what CEOs are doing. Make it stop. Make it stop. And then you don't think beyond that. But it's ironic because you end up it seems that you end up benefiting CEOs in all sorts of ways when you only look at one picture, how much are we consuming? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I would like to talk about that more on our next segment. We're coming to the end of our time. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for joining me on, on our next segment. We're uh, gonna talk a little more about this, uh, you know, well, what's the role of capital? What's the role of the CEOs? I wanna, you know, have more of a conversation with you about what we just talked about. But thank you for joining me. Thank you for the thank you to the audience. And we will uh, come back in the next segment.